So this is for a just a class paper. For at, I'm taking. I'm an undergraduate geography major at the University of Minnesota. Oh, cool. So I spend a lot of time with the Earth, so it's cool to hear about flat Earth and, and all this stuff and hear from you. Awesome. Um, my, my project is on less about necessarily like combating or, or promoting flat Earth beliefs, but more about asking um, what, as someone who's like in the – the sort of scientific establishment or whatever are hoping to be when I finally get my degree. Um, what can we learn from, from flat earth and how we deal as a community with people who have beliefs outside of ours? Sure. Um, so my, my big question for my project is like, what does the flat earth belief reveal about the nature of the scientific community. I don't know if you like necessarily that term, the scientific community. Oh no, no, that's fine. That that's fine. We're we're pretty flexible when it comes to that. Um, but what is what is flat Earth? How does flat Earth paint? Okay, we should be okay. Okay, so how does how does flat Earth view the scientific community, or you know, my, my personal opinion, or me trying to be objective? Um, well, what, what, I, what I'd like to, I mean, the big question is what can we or I as a member of the sort of scientific community learn about ourselves and use to improve ourselves from dealing with the flat earth belief? But that implies all sorts of questions of what does flat earth believe about us? What do we think of them and, and how have we interacted? Got it. Um, Got it. So I was wondering to start with, um, for the sake of the, the record, I guess, um, what 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 is your belief in the flat earth just i i've, I've watched plenty of your videos but just oh sure 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 my belief in the yeah. flat earth is that we are not a tiny little rock going through an impossible universe in multiple directions and that we are nothing that we are some insignificant speck that was created by accident and our lives have no meaning uh, we, mm -hmm. it, it is much, much smaller. There is no universe. There is no space. There are no three dimensional planets that are, you know, flying around. We are in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling and mm -hmm. our, our lives mean everything we are. It's an old belief made new again, you know, that, that this universe is much more intimate and it's not nearly as complex as we like to make it out to be. And that's basically the long and the short of it. Um, but to, to kind of get into what you were talking to with in, you know, about science in, in the first place is that I, you know, I love science. We're, we're talking on science. We're, you know, the foundations of science have built a lot of great things over the years. But at the same time, they have taken liberties much like religions have. You know, they have taken leaps of faith. And at some point, you know, the old saying is power corrupts. At some point science early on they realized that if you wear the white coat you immediately have credibility and the average person on the street will take your word for it well that's a powerful thing that means you don't have to try as hard and that means you can make leaps of faith even though you shouldn't make leaps of faith you should leave things open-ended you should leave the big question marks uh the, you know you've seen my videos the the core of the earth is a perfect example which is the core of the earth science has no idea not even remotely close what the core of the earth looks like but they we all see those those cross sections that are perfectly divided in thousand mile segments even though the deepest hole ever drilled is only eight miles and the reason they yeah. do, the reason they do that is because science does not like in fact they they hate it more than just about anything they hate putting a question mark on a textbook you know, the Earth literally should be in, in science, even even without flat Earth, the the Earth should be this globe with this giant question mark in the inside of it. That's what it should be. And science will not do that because it makes the institution look less credible. And only now with social media and high speed Internet and six billion smartphones are people starting to punch holes in the narrative that that is science science is science not only has make it has made some massive mistakes over the years but they they preach things as gospel and, you know little play on words there that just because they can 
and it drives it drives me freaking insane and so it, again we don't it's this weird paradox for me because i grew up in the tech field i grew up in you know doing 20 years of tech support you know i, I love technology i love cutting edge everything and i were know you a, were you a games reporter sorry what remember right here. Were you a were you a professional video game player or a reporter on video games? Oh no, I was a player. Uh, I started out in the '90s. I was playing video games for a living before just about anybody was playing them for a living. I was literally hired as a ringer for a, a little software house, house out of Boulder, and so and then parlayed that into tech support positions in different startup companies around Boulder because Boulder was a great place to do tech. Still is, but it was really great in the '90s and early 2000s. And so I loved it. I, I absolutely loved it. So when I got into this fact, I even, I was even, I was probably the, maybe it's the reason why I've gotten to do so much with Flat Earth is that I was one of the epitome of science is great. And, and you know, I just embraced everything that it was. Uh, I even loved the globe as an icon. I collected a lot of weird, because I had disposable income at the time. And I even collected antique globes, <laughs> literally, you know. I, I had multiple globes and world maps all over the house, and uh, I thought it was great. It was my running joke. It's like, well, if I ever wake up and I don't know where I am, all I have to do is look at the walls. And <laughs> so it was a really strange thing for me. That's why I held on longer than most. I mean, <clears throat> people say, well, you've got an answer to just about everything, you know, when it when it comes to Flat Earth. I was like, yeah, I should hope so, because I hated Flat Earth for nine months. I, I beat that thing into the ground. And I couldn't kill it to where that's where I just came back. So, you know what? I'm going to go the other way and see if anybody else can kill it. And I was hoping that somebody would even today. You know, people say, well, you know, you wouldn't quit up Flat Earth if you if you wanted to. I go, well, yeah, I could. I could. But you'd have to find a way to, to, to do it. Somebody, have, you know, why hasn't this thing been shut down in five years? So anyway, sorry, I ramble. And and I'm I, and I'm I've got this I'm recording the audio on this uh, through um, through Skype so I'll I'll drop the audio file to you after we're done. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um. I, so I was going to ask, would you say? I mean, you just talked about your personal feelings on science is great. The scientific community generally isn't so great, um, or ha has some major flaws. Well, would you say that's it's it's not oh, sorry, in, it's it's not infallible is what I'm getting at. We, we tend to put science on this, and science does this to itself as well. They put themselves on this very, very high, well-decorated, well, well you know, ornate pedestal that, this, oh yeah, science is incorruptible. Neil deGrasse Tyson, that, that quote, which just, I can't believe he uttered it, where he said, science is true whether or not you believe in it. And the, it's like, okay, but, but that's, a, that's a very slippery slope. You're basically saying that once science puts its stamp on it, it's absolutely true. And that's where I, you know, like my speech this year, that's where I came up with the coelacanth fish. You know, the, if, you, if you've known anything about that, you know, science said that, that's one of my wonderful things where science is only true until the day that it isn't. So the, coel the coelacanth fish, prehistoric fish, they found fossil records of it, dead, extinct, 70 million years. Every scientist in the world, every one of them would have bet everything they had. And their careers, their family, their firstborn, they would have bet everything that that was absolutely true because of the, the record. And then they caught one in a net offside of, um, outside of South Africa. And then another one in, in Mozambique and Madagascar. And then finally National Geographic started swimming with them. And it's like, oh, okay, apparently it isn't dead. Well, okay. What? How? How can? How can something be that wrong? You know, how can you be off by that much? And people say, and and people say, what's your point? And my my point is, don't assume anything just because of what science says. So when I come back at you and say, well, does this mean, you know, if I came at you and said, there's plesiosaurs possibly swimming around the lakes of not Loch Ness. And you're saying, well, that's, that's stupid. That's ridiculous, right? And I go, really? And I go, why? And so you say, well, the plesiosaur has been dead for at least 100 million years. And then I come back and I show you that stupid fish. It's like, now it's not so crazy anymore. And what bugs me most is about, about science is this. When they, like, for example, when that fish was found, they immediately started backpedaling and came up with all sorts of reasons for why this thing's still alive. You know, saying, well, it's a living fossil. They had to make up new terms. Like, it's a living fossil. 
and it's an yeah. it's an evolutionary uh, state of of stasis. <laughs> like what? So like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, it's not evolving right now. It's like, oh, it's been 70 million years. Is it going to evolve? So either one of two things is true here. Either the carbon dating system is completely screwed up, completely off, or, well, actually, that's, that's the only option, <laughs> really, is what, what I'm saying here. Because science is, is, makes huge, and, and of course, that's, that's just the, the mistakes they make. Like, let's not, let's not forget the stuff when they take the money and change the results for quarterly profits, you know, for the stockholders, yeah. uh, the mistakes. In the, and they say, well, what are you talking about? I go, go, scientists cut corners all the time for money. Uh, you know, lead paint was released. <laughs> uh, lead gasoline, don't have really a lot of that anymore. Um, DDT and all the variations of DDT, with all, which almost wiped out entire ecosystems in this country just because we wanted to kill the mosquitoes. Um, uh, asbestos, <laughs> still paying out on those. You know, there's still television commercials on asbestos. Uh, and then, of course, the probably the most famous is, you know, all the, the scientists that came out that took the money and said, oh, yeah, cigarettes, <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> no problem yeah. whatsoever. So so I'm sorry when it's again, it's not that I hate science. I don't. But I what I try to remind people is that it's not infallible. It's not incorruptible. It is if you, if science wants to put themselves on a lofty pedestal that they've been doing for decades and decades. Oh then they should try harder to at least be, you know, because nowadays it's, it, they've got, you're, you're going to be transparent whether you like it or not. You, you might as well be as honest as you can because the internet's going to figure it out. So, so. Yeah. And would you say this, this feeling of <clears throat> um, healthy doubt or a little skepticism about the scientific community is, the, the general attitude of the flat earth community oh yeah at, at the very least um the scientific community we, again they're not hated in the flat earth community but we tend to get a little irritated because of examples i i just gave you it's like when when yeah, no. science when science does it what was, what was the um the thing that just came out well, just a couple days ago where uh scientists are arguing there, there's a group of scientists arguing over this the oldest star ever i don't know if you saw that story where it was, yeah. it's called Methuselah and their scientists claiming, well, it's older than the universe. And it's like, w what? You, you can't, you can't have a star that's older than the universe. It, it, and, and they're actually arguing over this. And it's like, you're, you're contradicting one of the biggest claims you've ever done, which is, I mean, you're basically come along the lines of saying that, oh yeah, by the way, we found a smartphone that's actually older than the earth. It's like, what? <laughs> And so, but they're not backpedaling fast enough. So science is in this weird crux where there's different groups now that are, of course, they're arguing over the, now, now, of course, this leads um, credence to a bunch of different groups that are saying that are challenging the age of the universe itself. And we take it a whole nother step further. And, oh, I'm sorry. One more thing, which is if we had to, if, if we had to say that, that flat earth has an, an enemy, it's not necessarily science you know it's not all scientists obviously uh but nasa yeah. nasa is probably the number one thing because they are the face of science i mean let's face it i mean you, yes there's some fantastic phds out there that have been published a whole bunch of times but the most famous scientist in the world hasn't published anything it's neil degrasse tyson and the second one is uh brian cox out of the uk and then probably michio kaku after that and these are guys that are on television these are guys that are on social media the hardcore scientists because they're so specialized and so dry, they don't get out there. So mm. th that's another thing. If you get, if you guys want to improve your image, you've got to get some of your your heavy hitters to talk, you know, openly about things. You know, not just sit in a lab somewhere and, and utter one and two syllables. Because other th if you don't, you're going to have Neil deGrasse Tyson making cameos in movies and then eventually making quotes that he shouldn't be making. So. Yeah, I would like to say. Um... Since you're talking about things you'd <clears throat> excuse me you'd like to see what do you think um we should be doing to improve what do you think the science community can learn from their encounters um, with that? yeah the, the first thing is is get your your front men on the same page and probably change out front men with some with some people that are way more qualified 
uh, to talk about this stuff. I mean, it's great. You know, the I mean, why are the best sci why are the most popular scientists in the world, the top three? Why are they all astrophysicists? Because astrophysics, as you know, is theoretical to so many on so many levels. I mean, you know, you've got guys spending their entire lives right now researching dark matter. And it's known full well that dark matter is an absolute theory. I mean, you should start focusing on the other things like, I don't know, gravity. Um, because, yeah. you know, gra gravity itself is technically a theory. And Neil Tyson was the first one to, to say it on television. So uh, other things you could do to improve. Um, be honest. Be as honest as you can. And I know you can't do it in the corporate sense because the lawyers get involved and you sign contracts. It basically says, you know, do what we tell you and don't do what's right. Uh, yeah. But be as honest as you can, as transparent as you can and say, look, there's some things we don't know. And this is our best guess. You know, in the small print, very, very small print in, in Wiki, it says that, um, you know, they don't know what the, the core of the Earth looks like. They're extrapolating based on what comes up through volcanoes. That's it. It's like, oh, you might want to put that somewhere. And I don't get rid of all the freaking cross sections of what the Earth looks like. You know, those all those core mm -hmm. sections. Um, be, you know, and and engage people that, that most of the general public out there knows nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing about mathematics and chemistry and engineering, uh, any of that stuff. They don't they don't know any of it. So like when we came out and we said we had to look it up, we, we didn't know what the curvature of the earth was. And when we looked it up and told people about it, the average person, you they really have to think about it. And, you know, it's eight, you know, it's eight inches per mile squared. And yet you eight inches per mile squared should not be that be hard to understand. But it is because most people aren't. Uh, mathematically inclined so when and 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 then you know you, so in people people wonder why flat earth is resonating it's resonating because we came up with an easy way to explain the world that's way easier than the heliocentric model uh you know the the globe requires i don't know geometry and trigonometry and calculus and quantum mechanics and all this other stuff whereas the flat earth requires algebra maybe maybe if you're lucky that's that's about it. Unless you're describing the dome, maybe you might get a little geometry, but the rest of it's easy. Uh, you know, science. There was a great line from Nikola Tesla that he said that science has this notorious habit of building upon each other's equations, and without without looking at what they were building on, without re reviewing it, you know, taking a second look at it. And he goes, by the time you get five and six levels high, he goes, those equations mean absolutely nothing. Because nobody bothered to double check everybody, anybody else's work. So when somebody comes at me and say, oh, you're smart, or you think you're smarter than Einstein or Stephen Hawking or any of those guys? Like, no, no, not at all. I mean, these are brilliant men. No question. You know, very, very mathematically inclined and all that. But if the foundation that their work was based on was wrong, then their work by default is wrong. And sure. so I don't have to be smarter than them. All I have to do is, and, and again, if something... You probably heard me say it. It's like, can I prove to you the um, uh, the flat Earth right now? No, I can't. But can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only thing you have left to go to is some sort of flat Earth model? Yeah, I can. And and I've had scientists come at me and say, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough. I go, well, yeah, it is. In court, every day, you know, every year, reasonable doubt wins. And so, yeah, would you say? Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's I fine. was wondering. We're talking about um, we're talking about this relationship uh, and this reasonable doubt, as you said, in the scientific community. Would you say that people who end up as flat earthers have that reasonable doubt before they they join the flat earth movement? A lot of them, yes. Uh, I mean, it's you know, if you come from any sort of conspiracy background, anything at all, uh, then yes, it's very easy to uh, to look at the flat Earth and and look at and look at the scientific community with reasonable doubt. The other thing that hurts science is NASA, because Na NASA yeah. is for, and I hate to I hate to say this, but it's so true. NASA is the front man of science. You know, the, when when you look at the any news group, you know, Fox or NBC or CNN, you know, they have a little section, sports and weather and business and whatever the science and technology section is, the, invariably every single day now, there are um, things that are released by NASA. And so 
when we have reasonable doubt, when, you know, we can jump on that so quickly that it hurts all of science just because, you know, it's like, because NASA is equated to science. I mean, yes, they, you know, they're a military group, but they are, you know, science loves pushing them forward because they're the cutting edge. They're the ones like, oh, you know, they talk, NASA is the ones that talks about the loftiest of, of goals. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to do a space station. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. They never do any of it. But they're the only ones that talk with any sort of voice about it. You don't, you don't, every once in a while, yeah, you'll see a professor at Berkeley or MIT or USC or something like that. And they'll say, oh yeah, we could, we could do this, you know, but it's usually coupled with some other, something else that NASA is already doing. Sure. So. Um, can I ask you this question? Do you think that this is, I, I think this is a, maybe a little off topic for my project, but I was curious. Do you think that people in uh, the flat Earth community are? This is I don't I don't want this to to, to sound just strange. Are better off for being flat Earthers? I know a lot of times when people who consider themselves woken up to some sort of conspiracy theory say, "I know this is true and I have to keep going with it." But God, I wish I wish I didn't have to live my life with this this amount of knowledge or. or do you think people are better off for being flat in the flat Earth community? Oh well, I I can only speak for myself in that capacity, and and that is yes. Uh, if if you're asking like, do I regret being part of this whole flat Earth thing? You know, would I is ignorance bliss in this case? Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, the the first mm. the first chapter of the the book I just released, you know, literally says look away, and that is look if you like the light, your life the way it is, you wake up, everything's awesome, and you have no complaints whatsoever don't don't mess with it don't look at this because once you get into this i'm not kidding you it is a rabbit hole that there's a that you get to a point where you cannot climb back out of it which is why we have such a mass massive retention rate it's huge and mm. and every day that what i've been fond of saying or at least the back part of this year is every day i wake up and i try to destroy flat earth and every day i, I fail every time and, yeah. and i i ask people to I, i'd love to go back to my old life i would and which is why we use there's a lot of t-shirts and a lot of memes in our circles talking about um uh, the matrix comparison you know red pill versus blue pill and that is even if you could go back to the globe you can't because you were the one that tore it down in the first place we didn't convince you of anything the people that, that get into this you literally look at the globe and you try to come up with reasons to defend it and eventually you give up that's what everybody in the community does it may, it may take two weeks it may take two months but eventually they give up and so even though they may lose their enthusiasm in flat earth because you know they've lost friends and family and and you know co-workers laugh at them and stuff like that although not nearly as many as they used to be uh they can't go back to the globe if they want to because it's just hollow it's just a shell at that point and and i've talked to many people that have tried it's like yeah you know you just look at it it's like uh that thing you know you're you're better off just saying you're just basically staying flat earth neutral which means yeah i'll go with the flat earth i'm not going to go any meetups or activism i'm not going to make many videos in social media but but they're still flat i mean i have seen people walk you know pull off of social media that they're of course they're not going to recant flat earth but it's it's strange yeah yeah, um, then would you say, I, I'm wondering about people when they first find Flat Earth, um, if there is a similarity in where they are in their life, similar to like when someone first finds religion um, or something like that. It's very, yeah. it, it has that same feel to it. As far as the demographics go and what happens in people's, people's lives, it's really all over the map um, because nobody out of a hundred people there's very few out of those hundred people that'll get into flat earth the same way it, it's there's always because we have a kind of a shotgun pattern approach we hit hit you with so many different facets oh yeah you may be able to stop two or three but the rest are getting through and then yeah. it's a question of, of what resonates with you but yeah it there is a religious side to it and there's a, a real spiritual side to it to where all of a sudden you're turning this vast universe into a studio apartment and that yeah. so all of a sudden the universe becomes very very small but when that happens it becomes way more intimate and then you realize it's like oh wait a minute there there could be a higher power there could be god 
there's way there's way more of a, a realistic feel to it. So yeah. and the churches, you know, the five major religious houses of the world, they have latched on to this, you know, because it's become a recruiting tool because a lot of people have come back to the church because of this concept, because basically you're saying, well, if it was built, if it was a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling, then it was built by somebody. Yeah. Now, it may not be fill in the blank God here, but you're way closer to believing in God than you were before. And that's yeah, a... I was, so go ahead. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Um, do you do you find that people who enter the flat earth community later in life are were often raised in a religious community where science is maybe more in doubt than usual? Um, no, it really varies. Uh, I mean, there's some, it, 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 I've seen it all, all types. I mean, I've seen people grow up in, in academic communities, you know, where, you know, half the family have their master's degree and that doesn't seem to, now they have a harder time, of course, because, you know, you're going to try to sit at a dinner table with these guys and, and most of them are not going to, uh, give you at the time of day. <laughs> yeah. But religion, religious communities, yes, it does. It does help. A lot, and since eight out of ten people belong to some sort of religious house, uh, it makes it a, it makes it much much easier. And education has a lot to do with it too. If you don't have, if you have a a master's degree in anything, and I mean anything, you're not getting this. You, you the conditioning is just too much. If you have a bachelor's degree in a physical science, you're going to have a really really tough time. If you have a bachelor's degree in anything but a physical science then or less of education you are way more susceptible and then of course we skew younger we skew way younger uh you know what is it 18 to 24 year olds were already a third against the globe and then under 18 were over half at this point which is just bizarre sorry go ahead half of what half of america yeah yeah, or, or oh, wow. any any other country. Oh yeah, it's 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 absolutely now here's where it gets weird, but only if the poll is anonymous. <laughs> so if it because peer pressure is a powerful thing when it comes to flat earth. So I mean and I I I've seen this. I watched a straw poll live as it happens, just just spontaneous, where it was upwards of four thousand kids and we were scoring fifty three percent. Now, if you would have taken that same group of 3,000, 4,000 people and put them in a stadium and had them raise their hands, guarantee that that number would have gone down to single digits because they were, you know, be afraid of saying it around other people. But I mean, the, the younger people shouldn't surprise anybody because anybody, when you're younger, you're more uh, pliable. You're more likely to believe. And plus, you got to remember, we exist, the, the Flyers community exists on social media now and kids under the age of 30 that social media is credibility to them. You know, they, mm -hmm. they see social media figures, whether on YouTube or on Instagram or on Facebook, they see them as legitimate as any news. Yeah. Anybody that's on the news, in fact, even more so, you know, if, if, if they see somebody on Facebook that has several million followers and, you know, they will give them more credibility than somebody that just spent time on CNN, you know, a 15 minute segment on CNN. It's like, ah, that's for, you know, older people. They identify with social media, so which is why we've been just grabbing on. I mean, you're a perfect example. You know, you, I, you, I've done so many high schools and junior high schools and universities because of that documentary, which wouldn't even have happened two years ago. So we just keep getting, you know, younger and younger. Yeah, that's such a perfect age. You're, you're just starting to doubt your parents and and your schools, and of course. What a perfect age if you're going to start doubting the, the oh, of course, the world as a whole. I mean. Absolutely, and if and if the baby boomers, you know, it's that whole thing, you know, the baby boomers versus the millennials, Gen X gets a pass, yeah. which is if the baby boomers, you know, has already wrecked most of your future, this isn't much of a stretch. This is like, yeah. well, hell, why not? It's like I already, you know, I'm already not going to have so many things my parents had. So yeah, it's a it's a weird. But I didn't really expect that they would would latch on to it that quickly. But I knew we were onto something when there was I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, where there was this middle school that just out of the blue came up with their own lunch flat Earth club, 
<laughs> where they met at lunch. We're having it was like a group of probably thirty kids in there. Now, granted, it was a, a bit unruly and you know tough, and they, but they were doing it without teacher supervision, and they posted it on YouTube. It was just fa <laughs> just fascinating. Oh, that's incredible. Mm. Um, and so I know we're right around 30 minutes. I was wondering if you'd indulge me. Sure. All these questions are about um, socially what Flat Earth is like and, and how they feel about um, in relation to the scientific community. I was wondering, I heard you talk on a show. I'm a fan of Ono, Roth, and Carrie. Do you remember that? <laughs> um, yeah, they, they hate me. <laughs> they have been haunting me for, forever. But yeah, I remember that. That's really weird that you would listen to them. How how did you, out of all the interviews, how did you? That was what two years ago. I was I was a big fan of yours on that interview. I thought you, I uh, you know I was going into it from this background of of, of thinking flat Earth was very silly. Yeah. Um, and you were very well spoken, and 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 it was a. I know I don't know the behind the scenes politics here or whatever but i thought it was a, a very nice interview with you it was a good introduction to you well thank you me, thank you i mean they they were hoping and you know i generally go in blind when i'm when i'm going to do an interview i just don't i, I don't want to i don't want to set any expectations i just like okay let's just roll with it and i knew right away that they were trying to you know trying to to do what they could to convince me otherwise and it's like yeah. after after two hours, they got so frustrated that they they weren't going to let it go. And they have been following heck in the conference, you know, we just had in Dallas. They hired. Oh, the, uh... yeah, sorry, go ahead. yeah, they hired planes to fly over us, you know, saying, you know, the world research. The earth is round. Love Ross and Carrie. And it was so surreal for me because it's like I'm probably one of the few people in the whole conference that even knows who they are. You know, but because, and the only, I, and I look up and it's like, oh yeah, I told my friend, I go, the only reason that plane's even up there is because of an interview I did with them two years ago that they, it, it bugged them so much <laughs> that I wouldn't even budge. And I was like, why, why would I budge? It's like, you know, I, I firmly believe in this, but I get it. No, I, I, but, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. But you're the first person ever yeah. to bring up the Ross and Carrie interview. Uh, that I actually happen to know, I don't know if you have ever yeah, I'm guessing you probably don't listen to that. But that was a that was a joke fundraising goal. I think they had interviewed maybe Jaron Campanella, and Jaron said, "You never see any billboards saying research round Earth, uh, but you're seeing some flat Earth ones." And they're like, oh, "Well, maybe we'll make one." Uh, <laughs> I, I, um, but uh, I was going to ask on on that show, you had said it had been this is two years ago now at this point, but. Um, yeah. He said it had been years since you'd heard an original question. Yeah. So I asked my friends if they could help think of a question they thought you would have never heard before. So if you let me ask it. Yeah. Um, one of the early reasons Einstein was thinking light is a particle. Yeah. Uh, is because he noticed that during a an eclipse, when the moon was blocking the sun, light would bend around the moon right. and make the actual quarters of the moon small. I was wondering if there's an explanation for that because gravity isn't the same and the earth or the moon isn't necessarily a ball or in the sky. Um, there's an explanation for that in the flat earth model. Oh, no, 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 no. It's good. No, and you're right. That is, that is a pretty good original question. You're absolutely right. I am, and I'm aware of that experiment. The, um, yeah, it was the truth. Wow. That was almost a hundred years ago now. The, um, when it comes to the sky and, and I don't like bringing this up too much because it, it's really hard for people to understand, but you'll, you'll probably get it. Everything is an illusion, meaning whoever built this place and it was not us set it up to where the solar system was the trick was the illusion. Yeah. Uh, it's something I talked about in the clues, which was the only way to convince people that the world wasn't some sort of building is you had to get rid of the walls. You had to make them disappear. And you had to take that to the nth degree. So everything in the sky, when it comes to, you know, every, everything celestial, would have to be pretty damn accurate. Now, it's not perfect by, by any stretch, obviously, like the Methuselah star, a great example of that. But for the most part, it, is, it has worked. You know, for the last 100 years, at least, the, everything in the sky has followed the same what, what the what the scientists were, were hoping for what they were expecting in its soul i'm not saying the solar system doesn't exist visually i'm saying that 
it's not there physically. So yeah, if you see some gravity, you know, altering, you know, bending light, you, you, you know, that sort of experiment, fine. I, I have no problem with that. Um, but I'll, I'll take it, an, I'll take it a step further, which is, you know, people say, well, you know, I see the moons of Jupiter. And I say, fantastic. I go, I go, can you land on the moons of Jupiter? And they say, well, yes. And I go, really? How do you know? And, and because if you're in a building, you're not going to know anyway. They're just lights in the sky, no different than the moon and the sun and, and everything else. But yeah, no, I, I get it. That's actually a pretty good original question. It's not the, that question won't, won't, wouldn't get a lot of traction in most of our circles because it's a lot of people wouldn't know the experiment anyway, and they don't know what it means. And, but it's a good question. I like it. Uh, thank you. I was I was hoping I would ask something you maybe hadn't heard. Before. No, I had not heard that one, and uh, it's it's pretty good. But again, the everything in the sky is um, you know it's part of the illusion. It's it's part. It was done. Well, hell, but if you're going to go that way, that th there are certain mistakes that are that also happen in the sky. Um, one of those mistakes would be the um, uh, the parallax problem which is, you know, we, we've had, the, we have the same zodiac signs in the sky. They haven't moved. And we're talking about, you know, the, you know some of these stars, you know, you know what parallax scrolling is. So like some stars are five years, light, light years away. Some are a thousand, some, oh. some are a million light years away. And yet. I, I think you're talking about Samuel Robotham, right? He was parallax and early flat earth guy. I've been doing my research. Yeah, no, no. I'm just talking about just general parallax. So just, so oh. if, if the sky, you know, if, if, if some stars are really close and some stars are really far away and we're traveling through the solar system in multiple directions at some really, really high rates of speed, you know, a couple million miles an hour, if you're talking about the galaxy, if you believe that, then why haven't the stars moved? And I'm not talking about five yeah. years or 10 years or 100 years. I'm talking about a thousand years the stars haven't moved. The zodiacs, the zodiacs still look the same. So why? Why, why is that the case? Or, or go, we'll go another way. Um, one of my friends, <clears throat> David Weiss, who was talking about the brightness of stars, mm. which is, you know, we, the, the light, light sources lose their luminosity or whatever you want to call it, their brightness at very, yeah. very short distances. And yet we're talking about if, if you have a star that's fairly bright at five, 10 years, light, light years away, but there's another one that's 10,000 light years away, it should be undetectable. You should not be able to see this star. It's just too far. It's either that or it is, or the, the sizes are, are way, way, way off. And yet, you know, again, the average person doesn't know anything about that. The, the general public, the 99% that are out there that don't know anything about astrophysics or engineering or chemistry or, or, or math, that that's how we get away with it. Let me, let me throw out one more. And I'm, and I'm sorry, I, I won't cut this short. I know you have a few more questions, which is um, <clears throat> the, uh, the gravity versus the vacuum of space question. Which is how does our atmosphere stay on when it's next to a vacuum? It defies the law of thermodynamics. Um, the the argument you probably heard me say, and that is, if there's a vacuum chamber above you, let's say you have a second floor, you turn in a vacuum chamber, you put a cork in the ceiling, you pop the cork, what happens? It's instant. It's violent. Anyone can check this out. They can do a, a, a search online for videos. Um, vacuum versus a steel rail car. Vacuum is an extremely powerful thing. Extremely. You know the difference in pressure. Yeah. So then, and, and I say, why didn't gravity hold the air in your room instead of going upstairs? And you say, well, because the vacuum was too strong. And then I say, well, what is space? It's the ultimate vacuum chamber. It's huge. It's, 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 it's so massive that nothing should stand against it. And then you say, well, <clears throat> gravity. Gra gravity is the reason why it's not up, you know, why our atmosphere is still here. And I go, oh, don't you remember the experiment with the room? Same gravity, exact same gravity. In fact, with a much lesser force. So, you know, no scientist has ever come back and give me a reason why. They, I, I, can, I can do this all day with them and they just will not and, and they, they cannot acknowledge the, the possibility. It's like, isn't it possible that the only reason our atmosphere is here is because it's enclosed. It's in a pressurized system. And they call it air pressure for a reason, you know. What, and doesn't, doesn't the term greenhouse gases make more sense if it's an actual greenhouse? Sorry. Anyway, I ran. No, that's okay. I was wondering. Um, I've heard that vaguely before on different sites and stuff. I was wondering. It just occurred to me off the top of my head. I'm, I'm guessing you have a response because you spent much more time with this than I have. Yeah. Um, 
if in, in the globe model, there's vacuum on every side of us, right? Yep. There's the vacuum of space that's going forever. Right. If you had a, a vacuum in a controlled environment on Earth, um, something that's being pulled into that vacuum is going to be pulled toward the center of the vacuum. But if we have infinite vacuum all around us, it should be pulling us in every direction uh, with the same force. Sure. So would it equal out to a net force of nothing, to no force at all? It's a nice thought, but you could shrink it down and you'll you'll understand what happens. And that is you take a basketball, put it in the middle of a stadium, and turn that stadium into a vacuum. No matter what's on that vacuum, what whatever, if something is pressurized on that basketball, it's gone instantly. So I, 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 that's actually not a bad thought on your side. It's like, wouldn't it all cancel each other out? It's like, you yeah, no, <laughs> no, it's going to go somewhere because it's not going to be, it, even if you could say that it was absolutely perfectly, and I don't even know what the word perfectly means in this case, perfectly balanced yeah. vacuum on all sides, but you would also assume a perfect sphere in that case. And would, you know, and they always say the, the earth isn't a perfect sphere, nor would the, the atmosphere be completely, absolutely uniform in shape. So, eh. anyway, it's, it's, a, there are things that, again, the, the average person does not even, I, I, I use the vacuum thing and the average person doesn't get it because like in movies, for example, every time there's a, there's a, a punch, you know, somebody punches a hole in a spaceship in a movie, everyone runs around. It's like, oh, we've only got two minutes of air left. Let's run around and do all these things. It's like, what are you talking about? You're dead instantly 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 but for dramatic effect they you know hollywood always makes this slow air leak which is why i show people it's like look steel rail car versus vacuum it's 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 shocking how fast the pressure equalizes it's it's absolutely amazing because again it, it shouldn't surprise people because you're going from area of molecules to an area of nothingness the 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 difference that the equalization is within a fraction of a second I mean, you know, all the air in the ship, all the air in your lungs, and then you start, uh, it'd be a horrible way to die. Anyway, what else you got? Um, and one other thing is I was curious about, and I've been having a hard time on my, so I'm a, I'm a cartography major, basically, which means I make a lot of maps and I work with a lot of globes. Yeah. Um, and more like oblate spheroids and geoids and things. Right. I was wondering, I always hear that, um, the, that curvature measurement, what is it, eight? Eight inches eight, per mile squared or eight inches per mile per mile. So, um, so if yeah, it's... Yeah, I'm wondering where that comes from. Where that comes from? Uh, yeah, because if we're on a, on, on a sphere, that would make sense. Um, but if we're on, like, if we're trying to do really particular measurements over a relatively small area for how big we think in the globe model the Earth should be, yeah. um, things like being a lumpy earth things like being an oblate spheroid and having less curvature in certain parts than in others should matter right? yeah well it depends who you, that's another thing it depends who you talk to so like neil tyson right. comes on and he says that the earth not only is an oblate spheroid but it's pear-shaped but then he comes back he backtracks after we attack and says that well, technically, you would never notice. To, to your fingers, if you were holding it in your hands, it would still be a perfect sphere, like a, uh, like a pool ball. So, and by the way, the 8 inches per mile square thing only works well out to about 500 miles, give or take. Because then, then it'd start getting yeah. into some funky geometry. But less than 500 miles, it works absolutely fantastic. And, okay. and which is why also, by the way, as far as your lumpiness is concerned, which is why we always test over water. You know, if we can, yeah. unless unless we're talking about a salt flat in Utah or Bolivia or something like that, we always test over water because it's like, okay, well, we know there's no lumps in water. There should be, but there aren't. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing about water, which I should mention. And that is, even if, even if you got rid of the whole oblate spheroid thing, which again... <laughs> You, when you look up oblate, the, just the very definition of oblate spheroid, it looks like a squished basketball. But yeah. every photo ever taken by NASA is pixel perfect sphere. But that, that's not the part that bugs me most. It's the part about water. So centrifugal force is very, very powerful, right? And 
we know you know water moves very very quickly when it comes to you know the the effects of gravity so if you're like you know anyone like holds a cup of uh, like a cup of soda in their car right and they make a hard left turn you know you know full well what what can happen with with gravitational forces so if that's the case if centrifugal force is pulling things out to the side like a merry-go-round why isn't there any water bulge at all at the equator in fact, why do we have continents? You know, why is there even land at the equator? There should be, kind of like the rings of Saturn, there should be a bulge of water because, you know, we, have, we don't have any other planet to compare this with, coincidentally. Uh, in our solar system, you know, everything else is gas or whatever. If there's a ring of ice around Saturn, partially because of centrifugal force and, and the orbit, why don't we have a ring of water? Not, not saying that it's, we should be leaving the Earth, but why isn't there a big bulge around the equator? Uh, in, in, you know, in fact, it's completely uniform. There should be bald spots on the uh, North and South Pole, and there's not. So why why not? But anyway, sorry, this is a question I got. Well, that's good. I, I was hoping... Um, so I, I assume you've guessed by now that a bit of a, a globe head, but I um, one of my goals was to leave with a question I didn't know the answer to, uh, and to look up on my own. What? Uh, so you gave me one of those this night. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, I loved, don't don't get me wrong, nobody that gets into Flat Earth loves it as a concept right away. Everybody hates it. I, I hated it. I, everybody's like, in fact, the, the t-shirt literally reads, I became a Flat Earther because I tried to disprove Flat Earth. I hated it. And the, But the more you stare at the globe, the worse it gets for you. To where eventually you realize, and I kind of, I'm a big movie fan, I'm a big believer in good writing. And sure. If you watch movies, the reason why we give up on some movies is because there's so many plot holes that the suspension of disbelief just gets wrecked, and it's like ah, I'm not I'm not into this movie anymore. It does something dumb, like I don't know, The Last Jedi, just about everything in it. So imagine if you're you know one one story is the flat Earth and one story is the globe, you know, and they're they're crossing, you know, they're in their story boats crossing, you know, going from point A to point B. There's more, the longer you look at it, the more you realize there's more holes in the globe than there is in flat earth. And that's bad. Uh, now, as a scientist, you know, you're, you're on a scientific side of things. So you're, you, it, it will be tougher, way more difficult, if ever, for, for you to get into yeah. it. But the average person, they like easy. They like, they like something that makes more sense to where they don't make their head hurt. And the flat earth now is super easy to understand, at least the core concept. Yeah, there's some nagging questions that are out there, sure. But there's way more nagging questions in the globe. Again, that whole reasonable doubt thing. And so that's why, again, you know, the average person does not know physics, does not know that we use the same tools that science used to get away with things. Uh, and we use them now against the globe itself. Uh, let me Let me leave you with this real quick, which is, the yeah. the gravity versus the vacuum of space uh perfect example would be the, that's it's one of the only things by the way that defies thermodynamics the only other thing that defies thermodynamics is the spacesuit itself because the spacesuit should lack look like act like anything else in a vacuum chamber uh you can there's tons of videos you put any pressurized thing in a vacuum chamber a soft pressurized things football basketball volleyball stretch armstrong any anything with a pressure inside it it's going to burst eventually so like like a, a basketball you know you, you pump up a basketball with you know not doesn't take that much to pump up basketball but you can't fold it at that point you can't burst it and it's got layers it's, it's like what's your point my point is why doesn't a spacesuit do that why isn't a spacesuit a basketball why doesn't it go absolutely rigid what what magic technology is in there that st I don't care about oxygen levels or CO2 levels or heating or cooling. Tell me what magical technology is in there that stops the vacuum of space. And you you might come back and say, well, it's some high tech layer. I go, no, no, no. My winter coat has layers. All it does is keep out the cold. So and even if you could convince me even now, you know, we're going into 2020. Right. Even you convince me in 2020 that we've got some weird microprocessor technology that that combats the vacuum of space absolutely perfectly. I go, fine. How do we do it in 1969 with nothing? Ooh. Fine. In fact, last parting shot. Find me a clip because this is one of those things kind of like Return of the Jedi or I'm sorry, The Last Jedi. You watch that movie, by the way? Uh, yeah. OK. I don't know if you followed any of the Star Wars movies. So that was like the ninth movie. Right. 
Uh, Eight movies before that, no one ever talked about gas gauges ever. Never mentioned anything about gas gauges. No one ever ran out of fuel in Star Wars until they got to the ninth movie. It's like, okay, that's a thing now. It's like, what? What are you talking about? Find me a clip. Find me an audio clip of any space walk, any, any astronaut that talks about how much air they have left. Think that would be kind of a priority, right? Especially for guys on the moon. It's like, hey, we should probably get back in the capsule. I got 18 minutes of air left. No one ever talks about it. It's, what, how, how is that even freaking possible? It's like scuba divers are acutely aware of how much air they've got all the time. They're constantly looking at their gauges. Astronauts never looked at it. Not once. Kind of weird, huh? Anyway. Yeah. Anything else I can do for you? Uh, I just want to say, you know, it, it, it's nice to talk to you. I think, in my, in my personal belief, a lot of, it, it seems like a lot of people feel hurt in some way, and I, I feel really bad about that. As someone who's part of, or hopefully, fingers crossed, we get a degree and be part of this scientific community, I feel like we can do better to, if not convince you, at least treat you guys well and be respectful. Sure. Um, and uh yeah i just want to say thank you for spending your time with me. oh yeah my pleasure man uh i will email you the audio file it's probably going to come through uh we transfer but i'll shoot it off to you in the next five minutes all right thanks so much hey have a good one you too. Bye.